Okay, hello. So today we'll be talking about the fundamentals of immune privilege. This will be broken down into two lectures. Uh, today is the first, March 17th, and then March 19th. And then following that, we'll have a lecture on the ontogeny of mononuclear phagocytes on March 22nd and the 24th. Let's see here. Okay, so uh, first must start with um, acknowledging the original thinkers and those who have coined the term immune privilege. I believe that is uh, Sir, Me Sir Peter Medawar, who of course won the Nobel prize in the 1940s for immune tolerance by way of describing neonatal tolerance. This is a topic that we'll cover today. And his student, um, one of his students, Rupert Billingham, who played a large role in these, um, these studies along with Leslie Brandt and others um, sort of carried on the torch, if you will, with respect to immune privilege research. And uh, his, his, one of his uh, contributing students was uh, Wayne Stryline, who uh, then took the uh, world of immune, immune privilege into the molecular age, unfortunately. Um, he passed away in an untimely death in the early 2000s. So um, exactly uh, what would have happened with 20 more years of research is, is unfortunate to not have been able to witness. We will talk about immune privilege, but I do want to say this first, that it's essentially a, uh, a balancing act. That is to say, it's similar in all tissues. Um, carrying out immune homeostasis. That is, you have activating factors in the case of an infectious disease where you wanna uh, trigger effector T cell responses, which are pro-inflammatory in a manner, but then you also have regulatory T cells and regulatory mechanisms that dampen or suppress or stave off autoimmunity. And this is really the, the, a similar situation in immune privilege. One of the main differences being that the threshold for eliciting a pathogenic uh, inflammatory response is a lot higher in immune privileged tissues. Now, the term immune privilege was initially coined to describe unique anatomic sites where allografts enjoy prolonged periods or indefinite survival. So this is an operational term and it has to be understood that way and I'll talk about this more specific in more specific terms. And in order to understand uh, the nature of this, we must first review some fundamentals of transplantation immunology. So the first point is to understand the major histocompatibility complex as, the, uh, as a major determinant of immune rejection, of course, major histocompatibility complex, uh, as I've showed in these bullet points on the left here, uh, are important for antigen presentation and, and to, to T cells. And clearly, uh, because these genes have one of the uh, highest, if not the highest amount of polymorphisms, reasons for that being uh, to continue to develop a strong immune response, uh, is the reason for the uh, immunogenic nature in the transplantation setting. So for major uh, histocompatibility antigens in mice, for example, we're talking about class one and class two, you can see the alleles um, and the different haplotypes. For example, if we're looking at the, and by the way, for humans, it's the HLA complex, the human leukocyte antigen complex. In mice, it's called the MHC, major histocompatibility complex. So if you look at a valve C mouse, for example, the haplotype is D, that means at the K and the I, uh, IA and IE, as well as D region, the haplotype is D across. Now a DBT, DB2, DBA2 mouse is also a D haplotype with uh, across all antigens, so these, two mice, if you would transplant one organ into the other, vice versa, they would not have a major mismatch. There would be uh, a minor mismatch, which we'll talk about uh, again. But just to continue along this example, uh, 
Here you have a C3H mouse, which is a K. So they have a K haplotype at all of these loci. Um, and to give you a, uh, an understanding of the laws of transplantation, for example, if you take a Balb C mouse, which I told you has the D haplotype and transplanted the skin graft onto a host, Balb C mouse, of course, they have both MHC and minors uh, matching. And um, I'm surprised that we didn't have the minor. Looks like it skipped the slide or is it forward? Let's see here, sorry. Okay, so just let me, I'll, let me, for some reason this slide is out of order. Minor histocompatibilities are also antigenic determinants of immune rejection. They lie outside of the HLA region, um, but they're, they're a major source of polymorphisms that are antigenic. So these also can induce immune rejection. Okay, so now going back one slide and um, let's talk about the laws of transplantation. I mentioned the syngenetic, they're both a match at the major and minor. And so this is an accepted graph. There's no immunogenic determinants or alloantigens. This is similar to monozygotic twins uh, transplantation, of course. And allogeneic, so here you have only a minor mismatch when you have a donor strain skin grafted on the DBA2, they both the D haplotype, but there's a minor mismatch. And so these will be rejected. Um, another type of uh, mismatch, if you went from a Balb C to a C57 black six, this is an H2B. So if you had a um, mismatch, a minor mismatch, so we're talking H2D, onto a H2D recipient. These two are, are matched at the MHC low side, but not at minor. So you will also get a rejection. And then finally, if you have a complete mismatch, both major and minor, that is an H2D valve C onto a B6, you will also get a complete rejection. This is called first set rejection. These are T cell mediated, and it takes you know approximately a week or so uh, for these T cells to get activated, primed, revved up in such a fashion to cause rejection. If you then take the same mouse that had already rejected an H2D graft, and then went in with a regraft from the same donor strain into the mouse that had already rejected the uh, graft, you'll have a second set rejection. This occurs much faster. Again, this is now because the T cells have already been primed and activated to a specific set of alloantigens to reject. So this is a second set. Again, this happens quicker. The, uh, you can also achieve a second set rejection if you took the T cells from this mouse that had rejected and you transplant uh, a naive B6 mouse with a fresh H2D graft, because you've adoptively transferred those T cells, this mouse will now undergo a second set rejection, okay? Again, the T cells are, are being transferred over. However, if you instead transfer these T cells from the rejected mouse that had received an H2D graft, now into a naive mouse, which instead received an H2K, K haplotype graft, this will only be a first set rejection because the T cells that you have adoptively transferred were not primed against the H2K, okay? So this is a T cell mediated phenomenon. Again, this is the minor antigens, which I went over already. Now you can do the same sort of experiments with tumor cell lines. In this case, a P815 mastocytoma line, which is a DBA2 um, H2D uh, derived cell line. So if you put in a DBA2 mouse, this is no mismatch, you'll get uncontrolled tumor growth. By contrast, if you take P815 uh, mastocytoma, P815 cells, now place it subcutaneously in a valve C, the tumor growth will be controlled because you have a minor mismatch uh, and therefore uh, the tumor growth again will be controlled. You can also have a major and a minor mismatch if you place P815 cells into subcutaneously, for example, into a C3H mouse, that tumor growth will be controlled by an, an immune response. You can also 
uh, look at transplantation laws in the context of uh, tumor cells. Now, having that knowledge um, sort of uh, now appreciated, the other thing to understand is, is the eye, specifically the anterior chamber of the eye, which is uh, where many of the experiments, the early experiments, and still to this day, in terms of immune privilege, had been um, used as a model site for testing. This is a uh, fluid-filled space. It's right behind the cornea. Again, the cornea is where you put your contact lens. That's the tissue where on top you put the contact lens directly anterior to that is the anterior chamber filled with a fluid referred to as aqueous humor. This is right in front of the lens um, and in front of the vitreous and the retina. And this has been a very uh, uh, informative place to put in these allografts, heterotopic allograft tissues or cells to study immune privilege. This is an immune privilege site. So now knowing that, let's just sort of dive into uh, a very important uh, experiment published by Peter Medawar in 1947. What he did was to take um, skin from a cohort or from a certain strain of rabbit and transplant it in an allogeneic fashion to a cohort of rabbits, allowing them to now reject the graft, essentially priming the immune system against that graft, okay? So now, now what he did was he had two cohorts. One received the second allograft in the skin. And of course, you would anticipate that rabbit to now reject and reject in a, uh, a faster fashion. And the other cohort of mice received that graft in the anterior chamber of the eye instead of the skin. And it turned out that these grafts accepted as opposed to rejected. And so this sort of basically began, um, in addition to these uh, publications, of course, began uh, uh, the appreciation of an immune privileged tissue. By the way, um, clearly in the title, you see brain. Uh, he did a third cohort of rabbits, which I'm not showing here, which also were first allo rejected. And then instead of the anterior chamber of the eye or skin for a regraft, received it in the parenchyma of the brain. And those, uh, those transplants did reject. So there is clearly a difference between the immune privilege of the eye and in the brain such that primed T cells are capable of rejecting transplants in the parenchyma of the brain, but not in the anterior chamber. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So just to summarize this first part, the existence of immune privilege, as I had mentioned, was identified by experimental use of allogeneic tissue grafts, uh, tissue cells or grafts. These anatomical sites, such as the anterior chamber where an allograft experiences unusually prolonged intervals or indefinite survival and categorizes immune privilege. I'll talk about some more immune privilege sites and tissues. So uh, the, the other important question is whether this is a immunologic ignorance or sequestration of antigen. So is it is the transplant that was given in the anterior chamber of the eye allowed to survive solely by way of being sequestered from the systemic immune apparatus? And the answer is not completely. So to, to, to sort of um, dive into this question, I think it's important to understand the immune reflex arc. Uh, and it's, it's modeled after the neural reflex arc where you, you know, have, you touch a hot pan and have a reflex reaction. Of course, this happens in a, in a fraction of a second. Whereas in the immune reflex arc, it takes seven days uh, potentially to, to trigger a T cell response, which is essentially why we need an innate immune response to fill that void. But just a model system where you inject antigen into the skin, that antigen gets picked up by antigen presenting cells, namely dendritic cells that travel through the afferent lymphatics into a central processing tissue, the lymph node where T cells reside. They can then meet their T cells that have the cognate, uh, cognate uh, T cell receptor and then expand and uh, differentiate and then peripheralize into the peripheral blood where it then travels back to the skin to treat 
or deal with the antigen or the infection. So that's the immune reflex arc. So one wonders, uh, it's a, a, a question in terms of whether the graft placed in the anterior chamber is not rejected simply because the, um, the, uh, either there was no trafficking out or any trafficking into the eye of these T cells. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and, and this is just to sort of highlight after identifying or coining the phrase, there were um, all sorts of tissues being looked at in this manner. Uh, here's a table, uh, this is by uh, Billingham of natural privileged sites versus tissues. So, excuse me, a site is where uh, immune privilege, if you put a place an allograft there that would normally be rejected, a non-privileged site, it would be protected. So that's the anterior chamber, the cornea, the lens, the brain, the hamster cheek pouch, the testes, etc. There are privileged tissues um, which are similar to sites, but different in that you can take those tissues and transplant them elsewhere or heterotopically. So you can take cartilage and put it in the skin and it wouldn't reject. So there's something inherent about the tissue, not necessarily the site. And then of course they're inducible or artificial. You can, uh, for example, uh, it's considered that tumors are perhaps immune privileged in a way and that they suppress the immune response, which is why checkpoint blockade therapy has worked. And so that's, that's sort of a list. Now, um, if you look at the list though, you, you wonder, and this is what was uh, theorized then, that uh, many of these sites have a alymphatic nature. In, in other words, there are no lymphatic vessels there or, um, or very few. And so is it possible that these sites are privileged because of antigen sequestration and the, the immune reflex arc, that lymphatic uh, branch or part of the uh, arc, which drains antigen and antigen presenting cells is not there. And you can argue that that's not necessarily the case because in most of these actual sites, there are lymphatics not specifically there, but in adjacent structures. So this was a paper that uh, a really important paper rediscovery of the lymphatic vessels in the meninges. And there was another paper that came out simultaneously with this one, essentially showing that there are lymphatic channels in the meningeal tissues, which is uh, obviously encasing the parenchyma of the brain and that it can drain um, brain antigens um, to, to, uh, uh, to a large extent. And so even though lymphatics are not specifically in the tissue, they're adjacent and are able to drain. So there's a posse lymphatic nature to this tissue, which is um, the term we used in a recent, recent Nature Reviews article that um, our lab had published. The cornea is a similar, has a similar feature. The cornea proper itself, and this is the review that I'm referring to, is a vascular, it doesn't have lymphatics nor does it have blood vessels? But at the same time, um, these channels are located in an adjacent structure called the limbus. This is a very periphery. And it is known that antigen can drain. Now, it's true that antigen is draining probably a mu much lesser extent than if it was vascularized. Yet, at the same time, if you were to look at an inflammatory state, it's known that either of these vessels can invade the corneal proper. So you now have a vascularization of the tissue. So, so you know, one can sort of uh, surmise or conclude that the posse lymphatic state in these tissues probably does help slow down drainage and perhaps influence the T cell response in such a way that favors a regulatory response as, a, as opposed to an effector response. But this alone cannot explain um, immune, privilege, immune privilege as an entity. Now, the, um, the other thing that is quite uh, uh, obvious is that there are signals systemically um, that indicate 
that that antigen has been seen by the immune response. Okay, so this was a really nice paper in 1980 by Stryline um, and Niederkorn et al. Uh, showing that uh, there is an, indeed a systemic immune response, albeit a tolerogenic one, indicating that antigen sequestration hypothesis is, in, is not necessarily correct. So what they did here is to immunize or inoculate mice with P815 cells, these are DBA2, and remember, these have a minor mismatch to BALB-C. So they took BALB-C mice and they placed the DBA2 antigen. So P8, uh, excuse me, allograft. So P815 and DBA2 match. And these are the challenges to the BALB-C mouse. So what they did is if you took a mouse and you gave it a DBA2 allograft, these mice would reject within uh, 10, 11 days, which is consistent with a, with a, a first set rejection. If you now, um, prior to receiving a DBA2 graft, receive a DBA2 graft to prime the mouse and reject and then get a, uh, a, a transplant, you then get a quicker rejection. This is slightly faster, seven days. If you uh, similarly prime the mouse with P815 cells and then give them the, these mice, uh, DBA2 skin grafts, you also get a second set rejection, which you can see is quicker. However, if you first inoculate mice with P815 cells, and then uh, in, the, in, in the anterior chamber, and then graft the mouse with DBA2, a DBA2 skin graft on the balpsy, what one finds is a uh, suppression of immune rejection. You can see eight of these um, survived greater than 30 days. So there is a signal from placing the P815 cells that was systemic, let's call it systemic immune tolerance, and therefore allowed the consequent or subsequent, excuse me, allograft, matched allograft, instead of rejecting it, causing a second set rejection, actually suppressed the immune response that would normally reject it. So this is a systemic immune response, again, arguing against a sequestration hypothesis. Here is a paper one year later by the same group, essentially showing that the spleen is critical in inducing this systemic form of immune tolerance. They now call it, in 1981, anterior chamber associated immune deviation. Anterior chamber for the anterior chamber, deviation because the immune deviates, immune response deviates from what would be expected in a non-privileged site. So what they did is similarly, they took a BALB-C mouse, they used DBA2 skin grafts and P815, so you have a minor mismatch. So they took the graft or they took mice, if you did not splenectomize, that's to remove the spleen and did not give that mouse P815 cells intracamerally, that's in the anterior chamber, you had a first set rejection. So this is the day post, um, uh, po post uh, graft. And these are five mice, survive, survive, survive. By day 20, there's re full rejection. So you have out to day 30, zero days, zero grafts survived. If you do an intracameral injection instead, and then do a DBA2 graft onto a BALB-C, you get um, mice that uh, have, have grafts that survive at 80% rate out to 30 days. So this is the immune tolerance that was shown in the previous paper called decayed anterior chamber associated immune deviation. If you splenectomize the mouse, but did not give it the P815, you essentially see a very similar response. You see a, a first set rejection. So even in the absence of a spleen, it's not affecting, it's not suppressing the immune rejection responses. So that's just a control. And finally, if you, if you give the mouse a IC intracameral injection and splenectomize, you see you get a swift rejection um, and zero graph survival out to 30 days. So you, essentially you are um, disabling this immune tolerance by removing the spleen, suggesting that the spleen is critical in generating the, um, in, in generating this immune tolerance. And again, pointing against 
the sequestration theory, because clearly we're in the spleen now and we're out of the eye. Um, let's fast forward yet 10 years to 1990. Now, instead of immune rejection, these um, assays were actually done using the delayed type hypersensitivity response. Let me just tell you how this works. And DTH is essentially the immune response that triggers or causes graft rejection. You can think of this as like a TB test. So if you've been exposed to TB and you get the TB test, you get the swelling within 72 hours. So what you do is you take the mouse, you sensitize them to an alloantigen through subcutaneous injection, and then you wait two weeks approximately for priming of T cells, and then you um, give them a secondary exposure of that same alloantigen here using the PINA or the subcutaneous uh, in the uh, ear PINA, and you can then measure the swelling with caliper, with a caliper. And if you've done both of these um, exposures, you get major swelling within uh, 72 hours. If you just take a mouse that did not have a premium uh, a sensitization of priming or immunization imme injection, and then gave them the um, subcutaneous ear challenge, it would swell, but not substantially because you don't have primed T cells. This is a T cell primed swelling response. And then of course, if you give them the immunization, but you're not challenging them in the air, there'll be no swelling at all. So what they did was to take mice in which they induced the saccade response with alloantigens. They then transferred the um, blood or plasma or cellular fraction of the blood into um, mice that had received the alloantigen immunization um, and subcutaneous challenge to see whether whatever was transferred via the blood actually suppressed the delayed type hypersensitivity response. So Cade, like it suppresses immune rejection, also suppresses the delayed type hypersensitivity response. So when they transferred whole blood, they saw that the swelling was relatively minimal. This is in contrast to when they transferred the plasma fraction, you can see the DTH response was quite robust, signifying that while the whole blood is transferring this tolerogenic signal, the plasma fraction is not. And then in uh, striking contrast, if you took the cellular fraction of that blood, you do see that DTH is suppressed. So this basically told, uh, told us that it is in the cellular fraction of the blood that's carrying that AK tolerogenic signal. Again, um, telling us that this is not, or arguing against the systemic uh, or the antigen sequestration theory. Fast forward another 10 years, this is a review article by Wayne Stryline in uh, Nature Reviews Immunology, essentially uh, where the model of this splenic tolerogenic mechanism still stands. The concept is that when you introduce antigen into the anterior chamber, you have antigen presenting cells. And those antigen presenting cells, instead of going through the lymphatic, because there's no lymphatic access in this structure here, but you can access the systemic circulation through, for example, what's called the uveal scleral route or through the trabecular meshwork where there is um, channels for outflow of aqueous humor. Schlem's canal. So it's theorized that these APCs, which receive the antigen, and remember, these are in the anterior chamber, and I'll show you in a second, that the anterior chamber itself has immunosuppressive factors. Now reprograms this antigen presenting cell, which then travels in the blood, gets to the spleen and in the marginal zone, then activates a series of responses that leads to regulatory CD4 and CD8 cells. And this NKT cells are thought to play a role as well. So there's a splenic phase. And this then immediates immune tolerance, which is responsible for suppressing delay type uh, hypersensitivity as well as the uh, immune rejection of the transplant. So just to uh, summarize this section, there's evidence against why antigen sequestration um, does not fully explain the uh, immune privilege 
antigen drainage is not fully absent in IP sites and all IP sites, as I mentioned, the cornea and the brain, for example, including the anterior chamber of the eye, which has access to blood drainage. Placement of antigen into the AC anterior chamber leads to a form of systemic immune tolerance referred to as a CADE. This tolerogenic signal can be adoptively transferred by the cellular fraction of the blood and this form of tolerance is generated in the spleen, okay? Now, um, this is not the, so I've talked about uh, the systemic immune response in terms of tolerance. Um, and I've also talked about the uh, tissue borders, for example, the lack of, um, the lack of access to lymphatic or, or, or redu reduced lymphatic drainage. There are also local factors that contribute to immune privilege. Now think about this in the in, in initial experiment, which I, which I uh, suggested in the eye where you prime the mouse with an allograft in the skin and then came in with an allograft and put it in the anterior chamber of the eye. And that anterior chamber uh, graft did not, did not reject in, in that interval. So the question is how? So you've already primed, you've peripheralized, you've primed T cells. Why is it not allowed to, if sequestration is not fully evident, then why are those T cells not, not allowed to get in or are modified? How is that graft allowed to exist or, or survive? And the answer is that there's local factors that can either deactivate or kill the T cell or suppress the immune response. There's a classical example published in Science by Tom Ferguson in the mid 90s. And they showed that fast ligand is expressed widely in the anterior chamber tissues, which leads to apoptosis of uh, recruited immune cells. So potentially you can think of this as a T cell that comes in looking to reject that graft in the anterior chamber somehow comes in contact with a fast, fast ligand is expressing fast and, um, and, and receives fast ligand and then and essentially dies. Um, there is also been shown to be a very high TGF beta content there in the anterior chamber. So if you um, soak T cells and ask them to proliferate in a dish with TGF beta or the, let's just say the aqueous humor, um, those T cells will respond, proliferate and secrete inflammatory cytokines, perhaps interferon gamma, depending on what the cytokine is or the activation signal is. However, if you block TGF beta in that, in that setting as shown here, uh, you, lose, um, you lose that suppression, suggesting that TGF beta is critical. So this is also a local factor. Uh, here's here's a, um, also TGF beta in terms of antigen presenting cells that you can get infiltration of myeloid cells, and those would also potentially be um, able to activate T cells. But in this case, the TGF beta is actually reprogramming uh, to, to an extent the APCs, which now trigger them to produce less of an effector T cell response, even arguably, you can see less IL-12 and less interferon gamma, you can argue I'm not sure if this paper looked at it, but Tregs are being activated instead. It's also been shown uh, that the iris pigment epithelium expresses CD86, but instead of acting as a, uh, as a costimulatory molecule, acts to uh, CTLA-4 and therefore deactivates and leads to death of the T cells. So now you have a recruitment, potentially recruitment of T cells, which are now actively dying due to these factors. And there's others. Um, macrophage F480 has, shown, has been shown to be um, relevant. So this is in immune tolerance this is shown by Jones, Stein, Stryline in collaboration with Simon Gordon. There are NKT cells are obviously uh, been shown to be important in this case. But just to summarize here, how is immune privilege uh, privilege maintained. It's through anatomical features such as blood tissue barriers. We didn't talk so much about the blood retinal barrier, the uh, blood brain barrier, but that's obviously uh, 
a factor that inhibits um, access to these tissues. There's the posse lymphatic nature, which we talked about, whereby there are certain immune privileged tissues that don't necessarily have lymphatics, but do in the adjacent structure. So it's not clear that there's completely no lymphatic drainage. There is, it just seems to be one that favors a tolerogenic response. And then of course we have immune tolerance. In this case, anterior chamber associated immune deviation, a CAD, which was generated in the spleen. And then you have local factors, which I just um, uh, talked about. Uh, mainly, we talked about TGF beta, high TGF beta content. There's uh, vast neuropeptides work by Andy Taylor, for example, with alpha MSH, which we didn't talk about today. There are matricellular proteins, thrombospondin 1, that work by Sharma and Masley is shown to be critical. And then there's cell associated. We talked mainly about fast, fast ligand, but there's work on PD1 and PDL1, and of course, TGF beta associated, uh, cell associated TGF beta is also good um, to talk about. So the modern era of immune privilege describes the status of certain tissues or sites where passive and active processes are operative, which enable suppression of potentially pathologic innate and adaptive immune responses. I didn't talk today about innate responses, but those are indeed suppressed as well. Uh, and there's, there's a, a good literature on that in this case. And the last thing I do wanna say for this lecture is that immune privilege is not absolute. Just because a tissue is capable of eliciting an inflammatory response doesn't mean that it's not immune privileged. Just because there are antigen presenting cells or immune competent cells in the tissue doesn't mean it's not immune privileged. Privileges can be revoked. For example, in the United States, a driver's license is a privilege and that can be revoked. So immune privilege is not absolute but that doesn't mean that there's no such thing as immune privilege. And so this is one of the mis misconceptions. It's not an absolute situation. It's a threshold. It's a higher threshold needed to activate certain inflammatory processes. And obviously uh, evolutionarily have been, has, has been selected to protect these very delicate organ structures with post-mitotic cells, for example, neurons, um, which would otherwise uh, potentially lead to the death of the host. For example, if a mouse was, or an animal was blind, uh, clearly this, their survival would be um, impeded upon. So uh, that's, that is, uh, that's how I'll conclude this lecture. And, and the next one will be um, part two of immune privilege, specifically uh, talking at the more cellular and molecular level with an example, prime example of the cornea. So I look forward to seeing you then.